So recently, I've been re-watching a whole lot of animated movies from a whole lot of different companies. DreamWorks and Disney and Pixar, even dead studios like Fox Animations or Blue Sky, and observing how animated films have grown and changed throughout the last 20 to 30 years, looking at what was popular, what wasn't popular, what might have been overhyped, and what films I think are underrated. Yes, underrated. That dreaded word. It often feels like you can hardly read about any film ever without somebody appearing out of nowhere and launching into a rant about how nobody appreciates whatever film it is you're talking about, how it's a hidden gem, and that people just don't engage with the deeper hidden meanings. And all other films are obviously trash in comparison. And I do so hate to become one of those people, because I understand how very deeply annoying it is when people are constantly pushing their woe is me opinions on everybody else and complaining that the things they like aren't as popular or acclaimed as they probably should be. But since there's so much new content that comes out with the rise of streaming services and as more film companies than ever before seem to crop up out of the woodwork, I think it's a lot harder to re-watch and appreciate older films that you enjoy or that you never got around to seeing, as you often get swept away in the tide of trying to keep up with what's current. So in turn, this can serve as a little bit of a PSA that this film exists, that this film is good. And so recently, I sat down to watch Fantastic Mr. Fox, and god damn it, this film's great. Like, seriously great. One of the best animated films of all time, without a doubt. And it really sets itself apart with its art house vibe. And I think the world mostly seems to agree with this sentiment, at least from a critical perspective, as it's sitting on a very respectable 93% on Rotten Tomatoes based off of 245 reviews, and has a Metacritic score of 83 out of 100, which indicates universal acclaim. And then on top of that, it got nominated for a decent number of awards, including the Academy Awards for Best Animated Feature and Best Original Score, but ended up losing to Pixar's Up in both of those categories. But also, that's just one of the greatest animated films of all time as well, so I don't think you can really hold that against this film. You don't want to have to compare yourself to that. Plus, on top of that, I feel like people often just vote for Pixar no matter what, simply because of the prestige that studio's built up churning out classic after classic, so... This more obscure film never really had much of a chance in hell against that. So obviously, I think it's still pretty clear that this film's very well thought of. For those that saw it, it was a very enjoyable experience and very different in both tone and style to the majority of other animated films that are made in this day and age, or really any other animated film I've ever seen. It really stands apart from everything else in a category of its own, simply due to its unique nature. It's that classic Wes Anderson style just brought to an animated format, and it works wonders. There's just so much about the film to enjoy. But before we get into all of that, I should probably give a quick rundown of the film for those who either haven't seen it, or maybe don't remember it quite as clearly. So the film, Fantastic Mr. Fox, follows the adventures of Mr. Fox, obviously, and his personal journey coming to terms with being a family man and turning away from his checkered past. When we open the film, Foxy is a career poacher. He, along with his wife Felicity, makes his living raiding human farms and killing animals like chickens and squabs and taking them to either sell or eat. It's a high risk, high reward job that appeals to the adrenaline junkie. But after a near death experience and the revelation that his wife's pregnant, he promises he'll go on the straight and narrow from now on and get a normal job. A promise that he holds to for two human years, or 12 fox years. Starting a newspaper column and settling into the day to day rigours of quiet suburban life. But after his wife's nephew Christofferson comes to stay, things start to change for the family. Whilst Christofferson proves to be the perfect surrogate son, much to Ash, Fox's actual son's growing rage, Foxy also begins to develop a longing for his youth and the adventures of his past. And so, after purchasing a new home located in a tree near three of the most lucrative and dangerous farms in the valley, he and his new friend Kylie, as well as Christofferson, begin to rob each of the farms in turn, improving the family's financial situation and causing tension with Mrs. Fox. Meanwhile, the farmers have begun to notice that this fox keeps ransacking their farms, and thus they plan to take drastic measures to rid them of the pest once and for all. First, by ambushing him outside his house with gunfire, which leaves Mr. Fox without a tail, and then by trying to dig him out, only to find that the family's dug deeper into the ground. Realising that they only have a few ways out anyway, and that the animals will need to surface later for food and water, the farmers decide to wait and see. And as this is going on, Foxy and the family link up with other critters that live in the area that have also been driven underground by the farmers, and they all band together to dig a tunnel and rob the farmers once and for all, 
whilst Ash and Christofferson try to get Foxy's tail back, which had been turned into a trophy in one of the farmhouses. Christofferson, unfortunately, ends up getting captured and held prisoner, whilst the farmers flood the tunnels to flush them out once and for all, culminating in a final confrontation that ends the ongoing hostilities between farmers and animals, saves Christofferson, and finds the animals a new home in the sewers. A pretty exciting and gripping story. It really is just an all-round excellent film. But now, back to why it's good. And for starters, the characters. The characterization. It's all great. There aren't really all that many character arcs within the film that have much relevance to the narrative. Most of the characters are actually quite stagnant. They don't evolve or change as the film progresses. And whilst in many films I think this would be a bad thing, I think, in this context, it kind of works because they don't need to change. They're there to add flavour to the story, to have personalities that the main characters can bounce off of as they work their way through their arcs. But Foxy and his son Ash, they do have arcs. They do have character journeys. And they're the driving force of the film. Foxy has to learn to leave the past in the past for the sake of his family. He has to realise that by putting his desires first, he's been putting them in danger. Meanwhile, Ash needs to come to terms with his inferiority complex regarding his cousin Christofferson, and understand that it's not his cousin's fault that he's seemingly good at everything, and that in fact, he has his own struggles too. Whilst these are pretty basic arcs, they weave themselves throughout the entire film and help make the two characters extremely compelling as they both start off the film so flawed, like so deeply flawed as people. And then slowly, they start to shift their perspective, shift the way they act as the film goes along. And it's very compelling. Another great element of this film is the cinematography. It isn't often that you see an animated film from an English speaking country come out and just go balls to the wall in art housiness. Seriously, Wes Anderson, the director of this film, does not do things in halves. And like many of his other films, Fantastic Mr. Fox just has this innate quality that sets it apart from almost every other animated film of its era. It might not be the greatest film of all time, although it is still excellent, but the use of camera angles and a subdued colour palette, combined with its rustic art style, its fast-paced dialogue, its dry-biting sarcasm, and at times, absurdist humour, to craft a film that certainly stands up as one of the most individualistic, and unique animated films of all time. And yet despite this, despite being this good, I still think that this film is a prime candidate for sitting in that ever-growing category of underrated, which sounds ridiculous based on everything I've said, because once again, critics and audiences loved it, and it got some award nominations. But when you look at its commercial box office performance, it tells a different tale. It had a budget of $40 million, which isn't really all that much these days for an animated film, and yet was only able to bring in a little over $46 million. And let's be real, that's a terrible gross. And then factoring in advertising costs? There's simply no way that this film even came close to breaking even, surely. And once again, I'm sitting here just pondering how the hell can a film be so good and beloved, have a good script, and big name actors, shit, George Clooney and Meryl Streep are in this film, and yet remain super niche and obscure, as well as being a financial disaster. I mean, no one went to see it. And so, I have two major thoughts as to why. One, I think it might have been hampered by the lack of involvement by a major animated studio. Hoodwinked managed to scrape by in 2005 and earn a shit ton of money as an independent production. Most films can't do that. They need a big name studio to get their foot in the door and get people interested. Get people wanting to go and see this film. I feel like that's just the way the modern animated industry works for the most part. You either need a really captivating idea and a lot of luck, or you need to have an affiliation with a major studio. Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, these days Illumination as well. Those type of studios, hell, Blue Sky before it went defunct, they would all be fine. But instead, whilst they were affiliated with 20th Century Fox, the production companies they used didn't have that name value. So I think that's a big part of what hampered its success in the end. It would have had a bigger audience if there was some affiliation, like Ardman and DreamWorks had. And then the second thought was stop motion. For some reason, there's this general disinterest in stop motion, and I don't know what it is. Do people think it looks dated? Looks weird, creepy, boring? I don't know, but we see it time and time again that otherwise excellent films are hamstrung by the fact that they use stop motion animation. And I think it's such a catch-22. The films wouldn't be the same if they weren't made using stop motion, but at the same time, it seems to act as a barrier against financial success. Seriously, they feel like they are allergic to money. They repel it. This film, Fantastic Mr. Fox, is the 15th 
most financially successful stop motion film of all time. And it didn't really break even. I mean, it officially did, but when you factor in ad costs, there's no chance. But then you look at computer animation, and that 15th spot is held by Ice Age Continental Drift, a budget of around 90 million, and a gross of over 800 million. And then you look at 2D traditional animation, and that spot is Mulan, 304 million off a 90 million budget. So clearly there's something going wrong here, and it's quite sad to see. Because ultimately, whilst these films might be good, if they don't get people interested in watching, they're going to be forgotten to time. But anyway, that's all I really have to say about that. And I will remind you that these are just my opinions. And now I'd like to hear yours. What do you think of Fantastic Mr. Fox? Like it? Hate it? Overhyped? Underrated? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.